All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Welcome. My name is Marissa Berman. I'm the assistant director here at the Kufferberg Holocaust Center. We want to welcome you to our second program in the 2014-2015 National Endowment for the Humanities Colloquia Series. This year it's being led by um, Professor Carrie Lean. And the entire series is called Testimony Across the Disciplines, Cultural and Artistic Responses to Genocide. Today's workshop is the first of four, and it's being led by English department faculty, Dr. Susan Jacobowitz. So we're gonna start with a presentation that is entitled, Graphic Depictions of Genocide, Art Spiegelman, Joe Sacco, J.P. Stassen Take on Auschwitz, Bosnia, and Rwanda. So we'll start with the presentation, and then you guys will actually get the opportunity to do a workshop and create some of your own work that's a combination of art and writing and how uh, we depict war and genocide through other means, okay? So thank you so much for coming. Let me introduce Dr. Jacobowitz. Thank you so much. Let me get this set up. So um, do you want to hit the lights? We'll maybe make it a little bit darker so people can see the slides. So I'm so pleased to be here. I want to thank everyone for coming. Also, if you're thinking of working on a graphic piece, I know you're, the first thing you're going to be thinking is, oh my gosh, I can't draw. <laughs> but don't worry about it because um, I have I brought in some samples from my graphic students over the years. You know, a lot of people have that reaction that they can't draw, they don't know how to draw. You'd be surprised. Some people who are very famous for graphic work, like Harvey Picar, who does American Splendor, he can't draw. So there are all kinds of ways that you can get around it. We're going to talk about that. First, I want to show you some images. Um, I'm going to show you some images. I don't. I want that only to be half of the time that we have allotted. And then the second half, so I'm, I might run through them kind of quickly. And then the second half, um, you'll be able to start brainstorming some ideas um, for your own graphic piece, something you might want to produce as part of the, part of the colloquium event. Um, there's going to be an exhibit in the spring of student work here at the Kufferberg Center. You know, after we're finished, if you want to walk around the center and take a look at some of the exhibits, and some, of, some are permanent exhibits and some are temporary exhibits, um, you'll be able to see what goes on here and then you'll be able to submit student work. So with the graphic pieces, if you can kick off an idea or get something started today, I'll touch base with you um, throughout the colloquium series so you can kind of um, keep working on it and keep developing it and uh, my graphic students and my one English 102 students, we can keep talking about it in class. So hopefully you'll, you'll get a good beginning. Um, I will we'll put the lights out and I'll start by showing you some images. It's, it's a very difficult undertaking. You know, I know part of it, part of the surprise when graphic work came out is that you could tackle such important topics in a graphic form. How can you make a comic book about the Holocaust, a comic book about Rwanda? Um, but you'll see that people found ways of doing it and they, you know, they, they did it in a very effective way. This is the National Endowment for the Humanities Challenge Grant for this year, um, Testimony Across Disciplines. Students respond to genocide through culture and art, so that's part of what you're participating in right now. I have a couple of thank yous. I want to thank Professor Kerry Lane. He's a professor in the Academic Literacy Department. He couldn't be here today because he's teaching at John Jay. But um, he put together a really amazing program, and I'm very grateful to be able to be a part of it. I want to thank Dr. Flug and Marissa Berman. They're always, there's always so much support for the kinds of things we do through our teaching coming from the center. I want to thank my students. This is like a big thing to take on. My students and all of the students who are willing to take on something that is so difficult technically and also sometimes difficult emotionally. I'm really grateful to you. I wanted to dedicate my workshop today to my mom. My mom passed away this summer in June very suddenly and last year when I was running the NEH Challenge Grant and we had eight different events throughout the course of the year, my mom was at every single one. And she was very excited about the program for this year. She would have been here today. And um, I also wanted to show how well I've aged, because I'm the kid all the way on the left there. <laughs> and I think I look pretty much the same now. I also wanted to mention my dad. My dad um, was just here visiting. This is a very recent picture. So my dad is 85 years old. His name is Henry Jacobowitz. He lives in Phoenix, Arizona, where I grew up. Um, so I don't see him as often as I would like. He's a survivor of the Holocaust. This is the only picture I ever saw of him when he was a child. His family doesn't, they don't have any pictures of his family. Most of his family was killed when they were deported to Auschwitz in 1944 when my dad was 15. My dad was chosen for labor and he survived one year of labor and was liberated in 1945. Two months after he was liberated, he sat for this picture. 
He doesn't remember why or how or who or where, but it's dated June 6th, 1945, and he was liberated in April. And I was going through a box of pictures at an elderly relative's house, and I suddenly came across it. And I wasn't even sure it was my dad, because I've never seen a picture of him when he was a child. But it looked a lot like my little sister. And so I did a kind of double take. And I think you know the reason why I wanted to mention him is because a large part of the reason why we do this kind of work is because it involves people. It involves people, it involves families, and terrible things happen to people, unfortunately. And it's because we care about them and we care about what's happening. Some of the pictures, some of the graphic pictures that I'm going to ask you to look at today are really very disturbing and very difficult to look at. And I just want people to know I'm not a ghoul. You know, I don't just like looking at horrible pictures or thinking about horrible things. I feel it's part of the responsibility that we have, you know, to hear people's stories, to care about people's stories, and to tell people's stories. And obviously that's something I always felt very strongly as somebody's second generation. Those of us who have parents who survived the Holocaust are called second generation, uh, sons and daughters of survivors. And, um, and you'll find that there's a lot of creative work coming out of the second generation, um, some of which we're going to look at in a moment in the presentation. I wanted to show you some graphic work that actually was created during the Holocaust. It's kind of extraordinary. This man, Horst Rosenthal, was German and he fled, got picked up in France, stuck in a, a transit camp, a very nasty place called Gers in France, um, detained as a foreign national, uh, couldn't get out. I mean, it was just impossible to get out. The bureaucratic process was kind of crazy. And he created a graphic piece called Mickey Mouse and Gers about the frustrations of being trapped in Gers, basically. And he was deported to Auschwitz in 1942 and killed. So this is some of the graphic work he created. There are two other graphic works in archives that are actually part of, part of the graphic work that he created while he was being held in this camp. Um, he it's interesting that he chose Mickey Mouse, you know, kind, kind of famous, famous um, cartoon character to kind of show this kind of experience that was happening in this deportation camp in France at the time. Another woman who was creating graphic work during the Holocaust, you know, while this kind of ax was hanging over your head, was Charlotta Solomon. She was born in Berlin in 1917. She also was deported to Auschwitz when she was five months pregnant in 1943 and killed. She was an artist. She made these special kinds of drawings. Um, and while she was in France, again, trying to keep one step ahead of what was happening to Jews in Europe at the time, um, she created over 700 of these pictures that are part of a series called Life or Theater. And they're very interesting because they do combine graphic images with text. And when you're talking about graphic work, that's basically what you're trying to do. You're trying to have a visual expression of what you're depicting, and you can also use words. So it's words and pictures together. It's something Art Spiegelman often says when he defines graphic work, you know, words and pictures together. Another um, term that's been used sometimes is sequential art. You know, that you're showing something that happens in a sequence to try to, try to convey some particular experience. Art Spiegelman is one of the most famous graphic artists, and one of the things he's most famous for is Mouse. When Mouse came out, it was a huge sensation. It won a special Pulitzer Prize. It, w it went into multiple printings. It was translated into many languages. It's never been out of print. And if there's a graphic book that people have read, it's probably Mouse. One of the things that people found extraordinary about it was that it was a comic book about the Holocaust. <laughs> and you wouldn't think that you could maybe, you know, take a subject that's so heavy and um, use this kind of medium to explore it, but he did. And since you're going to be working on your own graphic pieces, or I'm hoping some of you will, I wanted to um, show you some of his early tries. You know, he didn't just sit down one day and create Mouse, which is an, an amazing masterpiece. He was working on it for 20 years. And he, 13, after he figured out what he was going to actually do. This was an early attempt, Prisoner on the Hell Planet, which is included in one of the mouse books. We were just looking at this in the graphic class. It's very different. It's not what you expect or what you know or remember of mouse. You know, it's not little mice. It's not little cats. So this was one attempt. He was using people, and he was using kind of creepy, sort of demonic looking people to kind of tell a scary story of his mother's suicide um, and the, the aftermath of her death. That was one early attempt. Another early <coughs> attempt, he did start working with mice and cats. This was, this was an early attempt that appeared in a graphic journal he had called Raw. So he put this in Raw. Um, 
and it's different it, visually. You know, the, the look and feel of it is different. The cats are creepier. The mice are mousier, if I can mm -hmm. say that. You know, with whiskers and more hairy, more furry. He was playing around with this, but you know, I think it's interesting for you to think about the fact that it's, it's not just brilliant from the get-go the first time. You know, you might have to play around a little bit and try to figure out, you know, which, which way is really going to work for you and work for the piece that you're trying to create. Then, of course, he, um, he came up with Mouse. Mouse was 13 years in the making. It was published in two installments because Art Spiegelman was worried about trademark inf infringement. Steven Spielberg was bringing out the film um, Ma uh, Mouse's Tale about Five of the Mouse, and he was afraid of, that he would be accused of copyright or trademark infringement. So he brought his out first, and then the second volume came out five years later. You can see the mice have kind of changed. You know, they look a little bit more bland, maybe, not quite so mousy. The Wall Street Journal called it the first masterpiece in comic book history. There have been a lot of masterpieces. I'm a big fan of, the, of the, the medium myself, so there have been a lot of masterpieces, but certainly its impact you know, was, was completely unprecedented for a graphic work. We won't talk a lot about the stories. I wanted to show you a little bit more of the graphic detail and just maybe talk about some of the visual things, since we don't have you know, all the time in the world today. Um, you have to show a lot of different kinds of things in your work. You know, one thing is, um, that you might think about yourself is you might want to show yourself getting the story. Not just the story that you're depicting, but yourself kind of getting the story, listening to the story or working to get the story. And that's what you see with, um, with this character of Artie throughout, is that he's doing oral history. Art Spiegelman did oral history with his father, Vladek. And he could have just told Vladek's story. You know, he wouldn't have to be a character in it at all. But Artie is a character in it too, and so he shows you the story of getting the story. And you'll notice as we go through that, you, that that's often employed as a technique in, in graphic work. You have to show very difficult, painful things sometimes when people are telling you a story. You have, you know, mice being hanged. You also have to depict, you know, some of the sort of pitiful situations, um, some of the things that made an impression on Vladek, his friend when they went into the camp, you know, was in a sort of pitiful situation with pants that didn't fit with one shoe, you know, with all the, all the sort of very pitiful. And the way that this is depicted so clearly in, in what Art Spiegelman creates visually, it's kind of drawn, drawn to your attention in this picture. Also, some of the very sad things about depicting war and genocide um, are not graphic in the sense of being grotesque. You know, we're going to see some pictures in a moment from, JP Sa uh, from Joe Sacco's work um, that's very different. But you also, I think, I think sometimes it just involves showing things that are very pitiful, very sad, very tragic. Um, people who were being deported, you saw them, you may not have known it, but you were seeing them for the last time. People were just kind of separated and that was sort of the end. And you get this kind of striking depiction of that in this graphic. Some iconic images that will show up again and again. Again, the cats became a little bit less scary, a little more bland. Um, but the top, right up at the top, you can just see the beginning of this, this iconic image of the gate. It was not just at Auschwitz that they had gates like this, but the one at Auschwitz is very famous. And it had a slogan running across the top of it, Arbeit macht frei, the work makes you free, work will free you, work is freeing, work is liberating, that kind of thing. Um, and you'll see this sort of iconic image, image coming up again and again in the graphic work. You might think, too, when you're tackling something yourself, whether or not there's some image that's immediately recognizable, that people will really sort of connect people to what you're trying to depict, the story that you're trying to tell. Um, something powerful visually that you can kind of capture like that. Oh, we have a repeat. This is, you know, this, this image with Art Spiegelman wearing his mouse mask is a very interesting one you know, to try to analyze as you're reading the work. But one of the things you can look at visually that you can get a sense of, even without reading the story, is that he's trying to communicate something about the toll that comes with telling the story. You know, these are not easy stories to tell, and they take a toll on the person who's telling them. So it's something also that you have to be kind of prepared for yourself. If you're going to explore a painful story with someone, you have to be prepared you know, for, for the toll it may take on you. 
you see a little bit of an attempt to show the scope or the breadth or the depth of the Holocaust um, in the image on your right with discarded pictures, you know, pictures falling. Um, all the different stories of the people in the photographs, a kind of cascade of difficult stories. Um, the reason why it's interesting, or one reason why it's interesting, is some people do incorporate photos into what they do. So the, these are drawings of photographs, but occasionally Art Spiegelman also uses actual photographs. And in some of the work we're going to look at by some of the other um, graphic artists, you'll see the incorporation of some photographs. So you can think also about the potential use of mixed media. You know, if you have a receipt, if you have a photograph, if you have a sonogram, if you have, you know, all kinds of different things that can kind of be worked in to give a sort of mixed media effect to the work that you create. Joe Sacco is also um, very uh, highly recognized. He's won all kinds of awards. Um, his work is recognized all over the world. He was, he trained as a journalist. He's, a, he's Maltese American, so he was born in Malta. Um, he was working as a journalist when he started I guess sort of animating his notebooks to create, to tell the story particularly of what was happening in Bosnia during the Bosnian War. He spent five months in Bosnia and later he put out this book called Safe Area Garajda, which provides not only a lot of complicated history and background, but graphically depicts eyewitness accounts by people who survived some of the atrocities that were committed in Bosnia. These are the images that are very graphic, so I just want to give you a heads up or a warning that some of the, um, he did not use mice, you know, or cats, he used people, and um, he w I think he really was trying very hard to convey the horror of what was happening in Bosnia. Um, this was what you may remember being described as ethnic cleansing, you know, where a Muslim population was being sort of targeted and driven out by, by Serbs during a very aggressive um, military action that lasted some years. He shows the devastation to the surrounding area as well. As you read his book, you see the areas that are depicted just become more and more scarred, blown up, shattered. You know, you could think about how you depict physical surroundings as well. Um, when he's, when he's um, depicting stories, this is about a massacre where people are driven out and they're fleeing very suddenly for their lives. You know, he, he tries to figure out how he's going to depict this with the action and the urgency and, and the detail, something that's being told to him, something he hasn't actually seen. And then the actual, you know, the, the actual killings of people um, are something that he doesn't shy away from depicting or try to make any easier for you, you know, as a viewer reading the book. It's a very hard-hitting book. There's some dis very disturbing eyewitness testimony. Um, there was an incident in which many, many people were killed on a bridge, um, whole families, and they were killed in this particular way. And, um, and I think what he was doing was considered a very important part of getting the word out about what had transpired, what had taken place in Bosnia during this, uh, during this war. He has eyewitness testimony from a survivor. And so um, it's a little bit of the same process maybe that Art Spiegelman was able to use in, in Mouse by speaking with Vladek. There's a scene, uh, there's a, there's a recounting in the story of when a uh, mass grave was opened. And these kinds of images are images that come up often in, in, uh, in depictions of these kinds of atrocities, these kinds of massacres are of you know, bodies and of, of graves. You'll see some of this in depictions of what happened in Rwanda as well. That the bodies themselves become very important um, symbols of man's inhumanity to man and of, of what happens when these kinds of conflicts uh, are underway. Um, you get depictions that show the, the struggle of some of the characters who are, who are giving him the stories. Um, this is Eden, who's an important character in this story, often just trying to defend his home and his community. And a lot of background. You know, depending on the story that you choose to tackle, you might have to educate your reader a lot. I think those of us who are tackling graphic books in the graphic class are maybe surprised by how much background you need. You need maps, you need history, you need talking heads. You know, you have Bill Clinton, you have, you know, leaders on the ground, you have, uh, you have uh, um, 
you know, people who represent the UN, you have press conferences, you have, um, you know, people being updated on TV, and you have to kind of give a lot of background because you can't maybe assume that people can just drop into your story and know immediately all of the background necessary for them to understand what, what you're trying to depict. 8,000 uh, Muslim boys and men were killed um, during the Bosnian War, which was kind of brought to an end uh, by American and NATO airstrikes that were called into the area, really to, were, were called in to hit Serbia. Um, and it's sort of an interesting historical moment now because those of you who follow the news, all right, just me. Um, there were, are some airstrikes, some airstrikes that, that are going on that were in the news just today, right? Because America and some, some Arab allies are trying to use targeted airstrikes right now to, uh, to curtail what, uh, what threat, what perceived threat. ISIS. Yeah, against ISIS. They're making airstrikes in Syria right now. So it's a kind of tactic or technique that was sort of honed during this time period because it was found to be very effective, but it came very late you know, too late to save these 8,000 Muslim men and boys who were taken while they were, t they were receiving shelter in a UN safe area. That's one reason why the title is Safe Area Garajda. This was supposed to be a safe area where people were protected by the United Nations. So this is maybe a particularly, and these are particularly difficult things to, um, to depict, to hear about, to depict, and to read. And so it, it, it's not an easy undertaking. Um, just for a refreshing breath of fresh air, here we go, like, you know, we'll go on to Rwanda. So the Rwanda genocide, we're going to be done soon, don't, it, don't worry. The Rwanda genocide was also a very shocking one. J.P. Stassen is Belgian. His mother actually is a Holocaust survivor. So, you know, it may, may have made him rather sensitive to these stories. He created probably the most classic work about the Rwandan genocide called Dio Gratias. And it tells the story of a Hutu boy. He draws it in a very different way, you know, especially the scenes that do not depict the conflict that happened before the conflict are very um, reminiscent of a famous Belgian artist whose footsteps he's kind of following in. You see the, the panels, the crisp panels, everything separated, very orderly with a lot of white space and sharp borders. This is a little bit in the tradition of um, a man named Hergé who created Tintin, a very famous Belgian artist. So you see this, this is almost like something that you would feel comfortable maybe giving to a child. It has the full color. You know, it doesn't have any shaky lines. Sometimes when people are working in pencil, sometimes when they're depicting war and genocide, they work in pencil with the intention of inking it later. But then some people have just left it in pencil because the pencil seems rather appropriate to something that's sort of so disturbing and kind of difficult to depict. He has very sharp, crisp lines, full color, you know, a very different style. This is Tintin. So Hergé, um, actually his name was George, I'm sorry, I have a typo there, but he was a Belgian artist. He, he lived for a long time and Tintin was very, very successful. And it, it sort of, um, it utilized the same kind of format of bright color, sharp borders, panels. And then, you know, he, he, he has some scenes that depict the traumatization of the boy during the Rwandan massacre. Um, the Rwandan genocide was, um, extremely disturbing. Again, not an easy one to understand. You would need something like this. You know, these are materials that were created at the time. This is not in his book, but this is something that I found online where they're trying to kind of explain something to us that's very complicated. First of all, would you be able to find Rwanda on a map? I'm not sure I could. Geography was not my strong suit. When I was in school, we could take world history or geography, but not both. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not sure if I could find it. Then you have to find it, and then you have to understand what was going on within the country. And so, you know, you might think about creating things like this yourself in your graphic work. I mean, some of it can be explanatory. Some of it can be kind of, you know, based around maps and maybe this, this kind of inform dry information that you're giving. Um, the, one of the most shocking things about this genocide is that it was, was low-tech means. Anybody know how most people were killed during the Rwanda genocide? Yeah, machetes. Yeah, most people were hacked to death. And so very low-tech means, and, um, and yet a huge number of people killed. It was about 800,000 people killed in 100 days. So it was considered um, a very, you know, very disturbing thing, a tragic thing. And also, you know, it's not just through graphic work people try to portray it. For all of the events that we're looking at, you'll find all kinds of mixed media attempts from photographs, 
the bodies, these are desiccated bodies that were excavated that are actually part of a, a monument exhibit in a museum, you know, the, uh, to sort of give some sense of the sort of horror of what happened. Hotel Rwanda was a film that was made. There were several films made about, about the Rwanda genocide. And a book that turned out to be very influential, We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed With Our Families, uh, by a journalist who happened to be, you know, to be there covering it, much the same way Joe Sacco was a journalist assigned to Bosnia. Ari Folman um, is an Israeli man who served in the Lebanon War. Um, in 1982, the Israel invaded Lebanon to try to bring stability, they would argue, <laughs> to Lebanon. Um, they got involved in a civil war there. Um, it led to a very notorious massacre of 800 people, 800 mostly women and children, um, in uh, two refugee camps, Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. He created a graphic film, and it also got released as a graphic book. So you can, you can both read it and watch it. And if any of these are materials that you want to look at, um, you don't need to be taking copious notes, because I created a bibliography that's available for you uh, through a library guide that is, you know, that, is, that is supporting the work of the grant. So I'll, I'll show you how to connect to that at the end of the presentation. Waltz with Bashir, very powerful film. Young man who was a sort of reluctant witness had kind of blocked it out of his mind what was happening at the time. Um, this is when he's guarding the camps, and Christian phalangists, a uh, Christian group, go in and they kill these people, but under the security cover of the Israeli army, which is stationed outside. So it was a very confusing kind of thing for people who were 18, 19 years old. Um, and uh, this is basically what was happening, is that people were just being brought out of their homes and just summarily killed. And again, there, was a lot of there, there were a lot of attempts to document it after it happened, after the effect. You saw a lot of news footage, a lot of photographs, a lot of first person oral history, a lot of testimony from people who had survived. I wanted to just briefly show you a few other graphic you know, ways that, you know, a lot of different graphic styles, a lot of different graphic experiences, not all of them as heavy you know, as that, as, that, as that kind of massacre or as covering genocide. But uh, Marjane Satrapi, also a very, very famous uh, graphic artist now who was born in Iran, was a child during the Iranian Revolution and then the Iran-Iraq War. So she, she has her own very definitive style, and she depicts a lot of the upheaval in her, in her country at that time from the perspective of a young girl. So you get a kind of interesting, um, an interesting perspective. That's her on the right. And this is a really interesting text that one of my colleagues brought to my attention. It was first published in 1946. So right after this had happened, this was the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, Japanese Americans were interned in camps, um, mostly in the Southwest and the Pacific Northwest. And Citizen 13660 is her first person eyewitness graphic account of, of what that experience was like. Joe Kubert has done a lot of graphic work that has to do with war. He was born in 1926 in Poland, and they left when he was a baby, so he was raised here. So he got out right before um, it would have been catastrophic to remain. You know, his family was Jewish, and had they remained, um, someone born in 1929 would have very little, a child would have very little chance of surviving what happened in Poland. So he seems to have always been very interested in depicting the, the trauma and the tragedy of war. He worked on Sergeant Rock, which was a very popular um, comic book. And this is that you can find collections of Sergeant Rock that have been collected into graphic novel form. He wrote a couple of graphic works about Vietnam. You can find, you can find a lot of graphic depictions of almost every war. You know, Iraq, from the, from the point of view of the military, people who are participating, you can find a lot of oral history testimony with soldiers. You can find depictions of Vietnam, of Iraq, of Afghanistan. Um, and one of the works he creates is an imaginary story. Again, he created it in pencil and then just left it in pencil. It's called Yassel, and it's about a boy in the Warsaw Ghetto. So sort of like an alter ego for him. Had he remained in Poland, it might have been him. And it tells the story of this boy who, who lives and dies in the, in the Warsaw Ghetto, during the Warsaw Ghetto um, uprising. He also, he had a colleague in Sarajevo during the Bosnian War. 
And after everything shut down, he was also a graphic artist. They used to meet at conferences, and they were friends. You know, the couples used to go out to dinner, and they would visit each other. And um, all of a sudden, when the Bosnian War begins, and Sarajevo comes under bombardment, and everything kind of goes crazy for his friend, every, all communication is cut off. You know, there are no phones. This is back in the dark ages. No cell phones, no texting, no Twitter. So really, the only way he was able to communicate with people in the outside world was by fax. So they would get these faxes from him, and the faxes would tell like what was going on for him and his family as they, they had a very perilous attempt to try to you know, survive um, what was happening and get out of Sarajevo, which ultimately they did. Um, so he published that as facts from Sarajevo. And you'll find things from all different perspectives. This is a very famous work by a Japanese graphic artist. Onward Towards Our Noble Deaths, which is about the experience of Japanese soldiers during World War II. This one also won a lot of awards and prizes. It's a very, very powerful piece. Um, Judenhaas is a work by Dave Sim, who was born in Canada. And he's not a survivor, but he decided to try to depict something about the experience of survival during the Holocaust. And he took very iconic photographs. This is a famous photograph that some people might recognize. And he recreated it through drawing. You know, so it's one of the techniques that you can use sometimes is to take a photograph and kind of render it, um, render it in a, draw, a drawn version for a graphic piece. And again, you know, very iconic images, things that people will immediately recognize and kind of um, key into as, as stories that have to do with the destruction of the Jews during the Holocaust. This is by a survivor, but she was born in 1943. So how could she have survived? How old would she have been? Say when the war ends in 1945? She's two years old. She was on the run with her mother. And her mother, actually, they were able to, to stay alive. So she drew the whole thing in pencil. Again, very appropriate for what she's trying to depict, kind of sketchy memories, a child, and some vague things, and what she's been told. And the old, you get a little bit of color just around flags. And you get a little bit of color when she's in the present, when she's with her own children, raising her own family in America. Then that's depicted in color. But the past, always in this kind of sketchy black and white, unless it's the Nazi flag, um, this kind of black and white uh, depiction, very powerful. And she's um, brought out a second work as well called Letting It Go that also had really good reviews. So again, a different a kind of style. You know, different styles you might want to think about or that you might want to um, check out. This is a Canadian illustrator. She illustrates books, and she decided to illustrate her own book. She wrote a memoir about being the child of Holocaust survivors. It's called I Was a Child of Holocaust Survivors. And it has some very, very interesting graphic work in it. Because it has a lot of text as well, but just with some really interesting pictures. It's an interesting decision that you have to make. If you do a graphic piece, you're going to see all of these samples. You're going to see some samples from my students after we um, break. You'll see that there are a lot of different aesthetic choices to make. You know, maybe you want a lot of text and you know, stick figures. Or maybe you want to have very elaborate drawings and one or two words. You, know, you have to decide on the balance and the flow. So you'll see a, a lot of different ways people do it. Again, the Arbeit macht frei um, gate. It's a very interesting image for her. She, as a child, she's watching Westerns on TV. And she starts to sort of imagine her father as kind of like the sheriff at Auschwitz, kind of walking down the road in the camp. You know, she kind of fuses and conflates the two images together. And it's something that you can do in graphic work, too, is you can incorporate things that are fantasy, that are magical, that couldn't really happen, but that you want to convey visually f to make some particular point. You know? It also was turned into a short film. You can see the whole film. If you search for I Was a Child of Holocaust Survivors online, just go to Google. This short film comes up. It's maybe. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You can watch it in its entirety. And I was thinking that some of you might, you know, in creating a graphic piece, you might be able to create an actual short film. Because I know you're more technically proficient than I am. So any 12-year-old on the planet is more technically proficient than I am. And I sometimes I'm amazed by what my students will show me. Like, oh, I made this film. I did this. I did that. Like, it's no big deal. So if you happen to be one of those people, you could make a film. And the film could show as part of the student <coughs> exhibit on a monitor. And you would be able to have it included that way. Martin Lemmelman was raised in Brooklyn, and his mother was a survivor. And so um, when she was an old lady, she dropped a chicken on her foot, and she had to come recuperate with him. And while she was recovering from her chicken injury, uh, she told him the story of her survival as a child. And um, this, is, I thought, was an interesting part of what he drew. Is for a while, she and a brother and a cousin, I think, they, they, lived, they dug a hole in the forest and lived in a hole in the forest. And um, 
uh, and he actually explores like how you do that, you know, what you do. In Art Spiegelman too, there are a lot of sort of very instructive graphic images that kind of show you how you would do, how would you would repair a shoe if you were in a concentration camp and had to get a shoe repaired. You know, very instructive, how you would build a bunker if you needed a place to hide during deportations. This is how you build a, build a hole in the forest and then live in it for a year, you know? It's really very crazy stuff. Again, with photographs, mixed media, she's telling him about all the different family that was lost, this whole kind of community of people that are gone, and he draws himself. You can also be a character in your piece. You know, are you going to be just listening to the story or researching the story and drawing it, or are you going to interject yourself, in which case you're going to have to learn how to draw yourself and take some liberties. You know, make yourself a little taller, a little bit skinnier than maybe you are in real life, but you know, you can depict yourself however you want, and he appears as a character in, in his. This is paint. This is a Canadian lawyer who had some, his father was a survivor. At some point he taught himself how to paint. Now he has exhibits and everything. It's very, very interesting. And he wrote a little book called Preoccupied with My Father, and all of the images are paintings, sort of based on what his father told him about his experiences. And then there's a little bit of text, but it's mostly these kinds of images. Um, do you have to have firsthand personal experience? <laughs> no, you do not. This kid, this punk kid, this 13-year-old boy um, spent two years researching and drawing this book, Keeping My Hope. That's gotten a lot of attention lately. Um, he thought that Holocaust instruction in his school could be more effective. He thought it did not really capture the feel of the stories the way he thought that you could. And so he created a character, um, a Jewish man, a Polish Jewish man, a grandpa, and then he tells the whole story that he, that he researched about what happens to him. And uh, you know, did all the research. His mom would drive him to the library every day for two years, and then he, and then he would he would he drew this out this whole story. You know, so the fact that you don't know the story yourself, or you were not an eyewitness to something that happened, doesn't mean that you can't depict it if you're willing to do the groundwork. You know, if you're willing to go and do some research and figure out some of the de detail. It's really quite an amazing project. I think Hitler looked a little scarier than that myself, but it's a good attempt. You're going to come up with a topic or a theme. I wanted to mention a little bit about, about this aspect of the Holocaust, is that you may not be personally connected to the Holocaust. You may not be personally connected to war. I would hope myself that you've never been a personal witness to something like genocide. So what is it that you're going to write about? Well, what you're talking about with the Holocaust and with war is usually, it doesn't begin, it ends with death, but it doesn't begin with death. It begins with, um, often with racism, with persecution, economic persecution, revoking citizenship, isolating people, um, all kinds of different things. You know, the Nuremberg crime, uh, the Nuremberg laws, um, started out with you know revoking citizenship for Jews, taking Jewish property, you weren't allowed to practice your profession anymore, teachers were let go because that was considered a civil job, a public job. Um, you know, you can't marry, you can't, I mean, all kinds of things. And it ends with deportation and death. So if you're thinking of a theme that could connect, you know, it could be something that, that has to do with the beginning, you know, not the end. It doesn't have to end in death or in people being wiped out, some attempt at genocide, but it could have to do with persecution or discrimination or something that's very difficult for people to deal with now. I sometimes feel like everything bad has a root that you can trace back to the Holocaust and to World War II. So you could easily connect to something that's more relevant to you, to your family, to your community, but it would still relate in terms of themes to the kinds of things that were happening to people then. This, is, this shows how usually the net is cast wider, you know, because then it started to include the Roma, it included black people, it included mixed race people. It, you know, the, the, it never really stops with just one group. That's another reason maybe why it's important to care about what happens to other people because it often spreads out from this point. Um, it also involved things like sterilization and euthanasia. Mercy deaths, mercy killings, they killed people who were institutionalized, they practiced euthanasia, trying to come up with ways that they could kill people, you know, in groups, um, using things like gas. This was started on people who were disabled, people who were institutionalized. Um, 
ends up killing between 200 and 250,000 people um, who may just have needed care in some, part some particular way. Um, and people might say, well, that's barbaric. Nobody talks about sterilizing people or about euthanasia today. But of course we do. You know, we do talk about euthanasia, about whether or not people should have an option to end their own life or whether or not people should be able to help you end your life. But particularly, since I'm from Arizona, I thought this would be of particular interest. There's someone in Arizona who would like to be able to sterilize poor women. And this is recent. I mean, you often hear this. People will often say, perhaps you've heard a more mild version of it, like, why do people have children they can't afford to support? Why do they? Why did I have mine? I have two children. I have a hard time supporting them. Why did I have them, right? Was that appropriate that I have those children? So sometimes it just begins like that. But it's interesting that there was a bit of a pushback you know, when, when, when this came out um, recently. And they, they did at, you know, he was forced to resign as the first vice chair of the Arizona Republican Party. Not his position, though, you know. Um, so different groups of people were persecuted. Also, I think whenever you're studying, um, studying about something like the Holocaust or even, um, even some other conflicts that you might study, um, s some people are implicated more than others. It has a different effect on some people than on others. The persecution of Jews and the Roma was racial, and it was in totality, so the whole communities. Not just maybe you're being targeted because you're a student and you're against Hitler, they arrest you, but they leave your family alone. These were, they were targeted as whole communities. Um, so were Jehovah's Witnesses. So, and, and some of the conditions of your being in a concentration camp were different. You couldn't, if you were a Jew, you couldn't receive packages. You couldn't receive letters. Um, for a while, uh, after a certain point, they made a rule that only Jews would be gassed at Auschwitz. So if you were not Jewish, that gave you an advantage. But it still was a very serious thing to be in a concentration camp or a death camp for anybody. And so you can see different categories you know, of people who sort of fell, fell afoul of what was happening. Martin Niemöller was a German Protestant pastor who spent seven years in concentration camps. He was not Jewish. He was a pastor. But he did not. Um, he did not cooperate with Hitler. He did not like Hitler. Uh, Hitler did not like him. Uh, he did survive seven years of incarceration. And he's best remembered for this quotation. Probably people have encountered this in one form or another. I think they often use it when they're teaching about the Holocaust. First they came for the socialists, and I, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. A kind of idea that, you know, another reason why we care what happens to other people or when people are targeted in our society is because it does tend to spread. And it's a reflection, I think, upon who we are as a, as a nation and about our citizenship. You know, whether or not there's an idea of ethical citizenship, that means you have to care whether it affects you or not, you know, directly. Sooner or later, maybe it will. Then I brainstorm a whole bunch of related topics or themes that I thought you could use in your graphic piece. And then I thought, no, make them do it. <laughs> because by this point, you know, we're almost done with the graphic presentation, and you would probably be, be starting to fall asleep. So you know, just thinking about it yourself, you know, could you think of any connection that you could make to a related topic or theme? Maybe we'll just throw a few out now, but maybe you'll come up with a few later. But just something that has to do with oppression or persecution um, something nasty in any way, shape, or form that you feel is of concern maybe to you or to your community or to your family, something your family has been through perhaps. What might be something related that you could explore in a graphic piece, a story you would like to tell? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think this would be a fantastic thing to research and do a graphic piece about. You know, what is happening with unarmed black men being killed at the hands of law enforcement? You know, when they're having this investigation into what happened on Staten Island, what happened in Ferguson, and so this would be, I think, something that would be a, of, of great interest to people right now, and we would relate beautifully. What else? Maybe something in your family, something that you've heard stories about? What other kinds of topics or themes? Headlines are a good place to go. Maybe like after 9 11, the way that like, anger was kind of misdirected towards like, all Muslims. This would be a fantastic one. After 9 11, I had a student do an amazing graphic piece about that last semester, but I don't have it.
I wish I did, but she kept it. But um, about what it was like after 9-11 to, to be Muslim or to have people think you're Muslim, even Sikhs were targeted. I remember at the time there were articles about how some people, some Sikhs were taking off their turbans, not wearing their head coverings because they were being, you know, they were being, you know, they were the object of violence. So something like that would be extremely timely. Yeah. How about one more? They have like one more? So you're going to have a chance to brainstorm more in groups, but. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> that would be it. Would be very interesting. There, there were very few eyewitnesses to that, you know, who survived that. But there were a few people who survived that congressional party that was there. Um, but and even just doing it from the history of it, that was the very notorious Jonestown massacre, where I believe it was also 800 people were forced to drink this Kool-Aid that was laced with poison, and you had this kind of disastrous end to this community in Uganda that was supposed to be a very utopian community, an ideal community. That would be something really interesting. Yeah, very interesting to look at. So keep that, you can keep that in mind. Um, the, 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 the way that you can relate a topic or theme to what, you, what we're studying here today or looking at today. Yeah, and feel free to find a seat if you're standing, because I think there are some chairs. <sighs> You have different approaches. So you're going to think about different approaches when, I, when we break in a few minutes and I put you in your groups. So your own experience. Maybe you've been through something. Maybe you've been bullied. Maybe you've been through something. You know, maybe you've been through something that you could depict in a graphic piece in a powerful way to share that experience or to raise awareness for other people. You could do oral history with a family member or a friend or someone to whom you can gain access to interview. You know, if you know somebody who fled something or was undocumented or was a refugee or somebody who, you know, something, it, be alert to what might be around you that you could develop in terms of material. Maybe a grandparent or a parent would be willing to share a story with you. Maybe someone who's been in the military. I think there's still a lot of stories, you know, that are coming out of people who served in Vietnam that are still really powerful, would be powerful stories to explore. Then you want, you know, you want to do research. Even if it's you or if it's somebody else telling you, you want to research for context, for background. You want to draw, draw it. You want it to be accurate. You want it to have detail. You want to go and you want to do some, some legwork like that. Um, and that can probably be done you know, through any library or probably through your computer at home. You know? Thank God for Google, because <laughs> you can do a lot of research at home. I think the, and you have to remember how important the mission is. You know, I always include this on my syllabus, especially for my literature students. The sole substitute for an experience which we have not ourselves lived through is art and literature. You know, you don't want for people to have gone through all of these horrible things, but they can still learn from it and benefit and they should know about it and they can get that through your art, through your writing and your art, if you create it. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he was a famous Russian dissident who his writing brought out what was happening during, in the Soviet Union to people who were being sent to these really, this really horrible system of Russian prison camps up near the Arctic Circle in Siberia where people were being really tortured and killed. He brought all of that um, to people's attention. Look to the headlines. If you need an idea, you may not have to go further than like the New York Times because, or the Post, uh, because I've been looking at headlines. We have 51 million people right now who are displaced from their homes by conflict. So this is the highest number since World War II. You have refugees everywhere. It's a, it's a really disturbing um, problem with refugees and displaced people right now. That sets a kind of condition for genocide. They, the United Nations and people who try to keep a watch on genocide feel that the things that make people pr particularly vulnerable are being a, a, a racial, ethnic, or religious minority. That makes you vulnerable. And then any kind of displacement, and then any kind of scrabbling for resources or you know, um, fighting for resources. That's where I think climate change and global warming comes in. Was anybody at the march yesterday? Or in, oh, it was, wait a minute, it was Saturday. Yeah, did anybody go to the march in the city? On Sunday, I'm sorry, I don't know what day it is. Um, <laughs> Was it really Sunday? Yeah. Wow. It was amazing. It was awesome. Yeah. I mean, the, the, oh. the climate march, they had almost 400,000 people in the city. And um, the United Nations is having meetings about it now. And that's one reason why they timed the climate march. Uh, the climate, climate change and global warming is huge. You know, I think somebody could do something really interesting with that because that's going to set these conditions perhaps in play where people will be very vulnerable, um, particularly if you live in a country with a lot of exposure to the ocean, things like that, or the, the kind of pollution that they're suffering from in China right now. These are really important things. Boko Haram is in the news. That was the abduction of the Nigerian girls. That's been a kind of ongoing thing, like ISIS, that's been in and out of the news. You know, um, ISIS, the really 
graphic videos that they're posting of people being beheaded and things like that that you know keeps keeps it in the news and keeps it makes it a very important thing to to study the Ebola outbreak in West Africa you know this is pretty harrowing a lot of health workers and some of the leading experts in hemorrhagic fevers have gotten sick and died as part of trying to treat this Ebola outbreak um, Doctors Without Borders is pretty heavily involved. There could, be, there could be something pretty powerful to tell about that kind of story, too. You had a huge story this summer with unaccompanied children seeking entry into the U.S., mostly from Central American republics. A lot of those kids are still kind of warehoused on the border. They're trying to get lawyers to take those cases and to help them, but a lot of those kids will be deported back to the countries that they fled. The undocumented in the United States, I think there are always stories to tell. People are starting to come out and tell their stories, to tell someone's story, to tell your own story. You know, they, these are very powerful stories that are coming out now. Incarceration, there's a criminal justice series that Professor Akis runs um, where they have speakers come. Uh, talk about this huge issue in the United States, the fact that we incarcerate so many people. They say one in four Americans has been incarcerated now. So you have just a, just a huge number of people who are incarcerated and a huge issue for our country. The deaths of unarmed black men, which came up, I, I, that's been in the news a lot, and I think that's also important. Um, the violence against women one obviously comes out of what? What's been in the news a lot right now? Yeah, the NFL, the stuff coming out of the NFL. I thought it was just Ray Rice, but you know, it was also this guy Peterson, and then it went on, he, you know, somebody's nose being broken by a headbutt, and kids being whipped, and you know, it's crazy, you know, what, what's going on? So th this, uh, any kind of abuse, you know, these kinds of stories, but it's interesting, because now these stories are really kind of flowing out, and people kind of standing up and telling their stories, and um, there could be some interesting stories to tell. They're complicated stories. Um, abortion and family planning always remains a big one because there are always these attempts to sort of cut back on access to services, um, always debates about, you know, what women should and shouldn't be able to have access to, what they should and shouldn't do with their bodies. Um, it stays uh, an issue that's often in the news. LGBTQ discrimination and prejudice, you know, we've seen some huge breakthroughs, the defeat of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, um, the defeat of Don't Act, Ask, Don't Tell, getting rid of that, um, and um, marriage equality you know, in many states, but not, not, in, not in a majority of states. There's still, I think, 30 states or something, you know, still working on trying to get um, that kind of recognition. The not being allowed to marry does really resonate a little bit with the Nuremberg Laws, you know, because Nuremberg Laws, not everybody was allowed to marry, and you couldn't marry anybody you wanted. And in this country, for a while, when it was miscegenation, you know, black people and white people couldn't get married. And then the idea that you know, men m that same-sex partners can't marry their partners, you know, it kind of goes on. It, you can sort of follow a, a theme. I can't draw. Okay, that's, this, is, this is right before you go off to have your brainstorming. So I thought I would comfort you before you get, get too worried about it. I can't draw. You have a lot of options. Um, stick figures. You'll see in the samples that you can look through that my students have so graciously donated. Um, some people are extremely talented at drawing, and some people just do stick figures. You can still tell a powerful story with a stick figure. Collaboration. You have a 12-year-old brother or sister who's very artistic. Grab that kid. Okay, you have a friend who's an artist. You know somebody who likes to draw. You know somebody who's into it who would be willing to collaborate with you. So you would do the text and maybe they would do the drawing. That's fine. You just give them credit. You put, put their name on it, you know, and they can also be part of this project. You can cut and paste, you can download, you can do all kinds of different things on the computer. You can use photography, you can take pictures, and then you can create a, you know, a visual story using pictures. Some of my students have done that. There are computer programs to create comics. Try to use the free sample so you don't have to buy any software, but you can sometimes it'll, sometimes it'll let you make a short piece through a free sample you know, of some, some of this um, comic creating software. There's an app that you can download on your phone that will turn a digital photograph into a drawing. You know, like a filter that you can put on it where it looks like it's drawn rather than a photograph. Those are interesting to use too. And then a question mark because I'm sure there are more things people could come up with that I just haven't thought of yet or that I haven't seen anybody do yet. You could think of, you know, you could come up with something. You can think of something, you know, paint. If, if there's some medium you like to work in or a film or whatever it is, you could really, you know, you can really be as creative as you want. Um, my 102 students, my English 102 students are going to be working with artifacts. And so you might think about this when you draw, too. You know, when you're capturing things in images, these are photographs, but these are actual artifacts from the Holocaust. So this ring was just ex excavated at Sobibor, which was a death camp. And they found this ring. It's a wedding ring. Um, and they, found, they excavated it near a gas chamber, um, the remains of a gas chamber at Sobibor. 
Uh, these are things that you could draw. This is a little tiny book that was made for a prisoner in a camp by another prisoner, and she put some poetry in it. A little tiny book, you know, to make anything under these circumstances was kind of extraordinary. And the story of how these objects come to be donated and come to the museums, where they usually end up residing, is very interesting, too. These were a pair of shoes that belonged to a toddler in the lodge ghetto. She died, but the shoes somehow made it to Palestine and were with family members in Palestine and were donated to the museum at some point. You know, the, thing, the visual images, you can think how powerful visual images are, rather they're fo whether they're photographs or whether they're drawn. Um, a kiddush cup that was used um, Friday night for Sabbath dinner that was given to Gentile neighbors, to Christian neighbors to hold for a Jewish family was later reclaimed. This is a cross that a mother wore while she was in hiding with her child posing as a Catholic um, that was later donated to the museum. So all kinds of physical objects that are, you're going to be working with as well. The last thing I have to show you, these are just two examples of student work from last semester. A lot of the, exam the samples of student work are going to have to do with another assignment, not a genocide assignment. My students usually do a kind of slice of life graphic assignment where they're just trying to depict some little piece of their own life in a graphic form. But two of my students, these two over here, these two samples are, they didn't photograph so well here, so you can take a look at the, the real ones. Um, they tackled genocide last semester and they let me have their work. So this one relates, I think, very strongly to the exhibit right outside the door on the Korean comfort women. And it's only one page and it uses mixed media. There's an article, there's a poem, you know, there, there's, there's something in another language, there's a, a drawing. So, you know, you can, do very, you can do very interesting things even just on a page. It does, you don't have to write a book to have a, an effective graphic piece. And this is just a little bit on the inside. It, it didn't photograph too well, but a little bit of the inside of something that really is a book. You know, this is this one here. It has multiple pages. And someone's grandmother spoke to her about her experience of being a child in Korea during the Japanese occupation. And she got, was able to get pictures and put pictures and text together. I think for this one, you just want to make it kind of bigger and darker, you know, so that it can be, it can be accessed more easily by people who are looking at it from the outside. The library guide that's been created, this is the reference. This is where you'll find the graphic bibliography. So all the graphic works and even more graphic works than we had time to talk about today, you can find at the library. If you go um, to the library guide, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a heading where you can find the, the graphic bibliography. You can also get in touch with me at any time, too, for resources. These are websites that I use a lot, you know, mostly the museums, the national museums. One is in Israel, it's called Yad Vashem. One is in Washington, D.C., the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. They have tons of good resources. If you're going to be doing research, if you're going to be looking for artifacts, if, you're if you want some background material, Facing History on Ourselves is a very good site as well. And Human Rights Watch would have a lot of the things that you might, you know, that you might want to be um, uh, writing about or drawing or thinking about as you work on a project like this. Now it's going over to you. <laughs> and so I'm going to give you time to work at your tables, in your groups. And what you want to do for your brainstorming, I think, is to, to try to come up with a topic or theme. So maybe a couple of them. Maybe throw out a few. And maybe somebody will let you have one of theirs. Um, you know, a discarded one. Or, you know, try to brainstorm a couple of topics or themes. Think about what your goal is. You know, what is your goal in, in creating this, this piece? And then you want to have some ideas for your approach. Are you going to talk to somebody? Is it something you just know enough about yourself that you can just work with yourself? Um, are you going to have to find people somewhere who you can talk to? You know, we have Holocaust survivors here at the center who, are, who sometimes make themselves available, you know, to students. Um, you could, you might be able to find somebody who survived the Rwandan genocide, you know, talk to them and draw it. You know, what's going to be your approach to finding it? And then you need ideas for creating something visual. So you have to take stock. If you can't draw, what are you going to do? So I want you to have a chance to work and then so maybe, you know, 20 minutes, something like that. When we come back together again, I'll come around and I'll help you if I can. When we come back together again, you know, some people who have some ideas could may have maybe started fleshing this out a little bit, could maybe share their ideas with the group, and people can kind of be inspired by the brainstorming you were able to do today. Okay, so let's, we'll put up the lights, we'll get started on that part of it. Um, if you want to keep working on it, if you're not going to see me in class, if you're not my student and you're not going to see me in class, 
Uh, there are other colloquia as part of this series. There's some coming up. You can get the schedule online. And we can meet up at those, too. You'll be hearing some more about you know, how to create this kind of work. And um, you can keep working on it. The exhibit won't be until the spring, so you have some time. And you can be sort of working through your project and developing it. So I'll come, and you can kind of run it by me, and we can work on it some more together, too. Um, but would anybody be willing to, to come up and maybe talk about what they're thinking of doing? Please, can you come up and do it here? Be great. Hi everyone, I'm Laura. Um, I was speaking with my group about um, Emma Watson's recent UN speech this weekend on feminism and the organization she's promoting, He For She, where she's trying to just get the male community to be more involved in gender equality because there's so much backlash on the word itself, feminism. Uh, my goal is to just to pick the word in the way um, some female and male view it in a negative connotation. Oops, okay, sorry. It still, it still shows me, that's fine. You can still see it. Okay. Uh, ideas for approach. Um, I will basically depict the speech she gave. And recently, um, there's a man who made a website with a countdown to leak new photos of her after she made a speech. So I will also add that as well. Uh, ideas for creating something visual. Um, since I do have access to speech, as all of you do as well, I'll prob I could take screenshots of the speech. Um, in addition to that, I do want to incorporate drawing. So that's my brainstorming. I heard a lot of interesting ideas. I don't want to put anybody too on the spot, but you know, we'll come back together again. If you come to some of the other colloquia or when I see you in class or if you want to get in touch with me, we'll talk about it some more and I can maybe help you as you move through with these stages. But thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it and I I appreciate all the work that you're going to do for the exhibit. So thank you very much. Have a great break.